My name is Sasha Golob, and I'm the co-director of the Centre for Philosophy and Visual Arts, CPVA, at King's College London. Welcome to this episode of CPVA Artist Interviews, where we'll be talking with the artist Hester Reeve. Hester Reeve's creative practice encompasses live art, philosophy, drawing, and sculptural objects. And her work has been shown at venues including Tanzcourtier Vienna, Tate Britain, and the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. I began by asking Hester about the relationship between her practice and philosophy. Hester, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us here today. So I'd like to start just by asking you in general terms about the relationship between, between your practice and philosophy. I mean, one of the things that I've always found so interesting is that on the one hand, you see the two almost as kind of inextricable, but on the other hand, each is imperiling or putting at risk the other. So I was wondering if you could just start by saying a little about how you see that link. Yeah. Um, I mean, the reason I'm, I'm not jumping straight into words is because you've just jumped straight into sort of one of the paradoxes of my whole practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, and which I think is healthy, um, but I, I think it's also very difficult um, to speak of. And that is, on one hand, um, I'm, I can't do what I do unless I read philosophy. But I'm really doing that as an artist. I'm, I'm quite clear I want to be an artist. Um, so that the, the, there is this... Uh, I need the reading of philosophy in order to sort of clear the decks and to really feel that as an artist I'm really working from a point of um, freedom or from a point of... Um, some sort of beginning, I won't say freedom, some sort of beginning. And interestingly, I can't get that from other art, not other contemporary, I, I get that through a sort of, um, a sort of thought-based, abstract thought-based yes. dimension, yes. which philosophy contributes. So there's a, and I need that risk. I, I, I don't understand at the moment why I need that risk. I don't understand it other than I feel it's very important for art. It's not me wanting to be some daredevil. Um, at the same time, um, that makes me both be very excited and um, very committed to philosophy, but then it also makes me want to ask questions of that discipline. Yes. Because if I'm of a discipline, the discipline of fine art, that asks of itself so many conceptual questions yeah. as part of its artistic muscle... Yeah not just as an empty exercise, actually what we make somehow comes from that critical inquiry, um, then I can't help but want to ask philosophy of that. Where's philosophy's risk? Yes. And because so much of what I do does involve materials and the body, as well as reading and thinking, I find myself wanting to ask a philosophy, um, where is it willing to risk itself that way? And I think that's because, it's not because I'm frustrated by philosophy and I have no right to make any proclamations around the state of the discipline, really. It's more that I think there is something else beyond both art and philosophy as sort of disciplines that I know I'm trying to get to as an artist. Um, I don't think it's an actual destination, but it is something that somehow operating, reaching for makes art happen. And my sense is that there's a similar stretch or exercise or exp expression. I don't mean that in a sort of expression. I mean in terms of stuff, ideas, yeah, yeah. world, through philosophy. Um, so it's a strange position where I'm completely entwined with it and, and very interested, almost to the point of becoming a nerd, in those rare examples where a philosopher almost wanted to realise themselves as an artist. So Nietzsche and that... Uh, that effervescence in him, yeah, I yeah. find really fascinating yeah. um, and really convincing as an artist. I know philosophers tend to find Nietzsche not so convincing. Um, as, a, as the kind of artist I am, I find Nietzsche really convincing. Yeah. Um, and this sort of way of definitely being a philosopher. He has this identity and he has a practice and he has a discipline, but he's pummeling at something else and nothing, abs nothing esoteric. I mean... Yeah. It's to do with force or life and things like that. Yeah. 
So I'm also interested in artists that have tried to do that, although they tend to be less interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they've been less interesting than Nietzsche's. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, the few examples I'm looking at in history, they've been really passionate and really interesting as people, and their thought forms and their approaches to art have been really fascinating. Then what they've done in their work has sort of been hard to measure up. And I have real sympathy with them because I feel I'm exactly the same, at least in this stage in my, in right. my, in my work. But that's okay because there is something about the conceptual kingdom and the abstract thinking that I think many artists engage in as part of a studio practice. Yeah. And maybe I can ask you, I mean, this, this relationship between, between the lived, between the life and practice on the one hand and the conception on the other and you know the way in which all are interbound and yet also the way in which it's possible to articulate some kind of differences. So I mean I'm thinking about works like um, the B in philosophy where there there seems to be almost an ethical challenge to philosophy that in some sense um, it's failed to engage with or it risks failing to engage with a certain kind of um, a certain kind of lived experience or a certain kind of embodied experience. Um, and that there's been this kind of blind spot that you're seeking to articulate. Does that, does yes. that ring true? Yes, that, that's really well put. And uh, I just like that you use the word blind spot because when I was travelling here on the train and thinking of the bee in philosophy and how that bee can become various yeah, things, I was exactly. thinking at the moment for me that bee is really about blind, blind spot. Uh, and again, uh, I'm not in any position of the great master to be able to say, oh, philosophy, you have blind spots. Um, and as artists, we have blind spots too. But there is a sort of capacity in, the, in art practice, particularly if you're a live artist, where you're willing to actually take a risk with um, your own being. Yeah. And I mean less personality. I, I mean more the fact that I'm an I'm a existent creature and I mean, I, I really like what, I mean, Heidegger's influenced a lot of my thinking, but he says, you know, rather than us asking what might we do with philosophy, we should maybe be asking what can philosophy do with us? And by that, he doesn't mean a nice book and argument. He means that process of deep thinking and questioning. Yeah. So that's the point I'm trying to get, I, I'm interested in getting at. And, and it seems artists are more open to the fact that actually they might have to completely question who they are or even go through a quasi uh, stage of feeling quite shit and vulnerable. Um, so there's both personal risks involved with the discipline, but then also risks with the practice. There are many things I could be doing now that would make good art that might gain me admission into quite a lot of exhibitions and that's lovely we as an artist I love being part of exhibitions it's a fantastic joyful thing to be in but sometimes that risk makes me slightly monstrous slightly misfitting slightly you know uh, slightly deranged actually yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean that quite figure uh, literally actually I mean it's interesting you say deranged because I mean Another theme that's present in this call to risk is a kind of call to consideration, to a sort of considered lived existence, an awareness of the lived existence. Um, and there are parts of your practice that remind me, remind me of the kind of philosophical emphasis you see in people like Haddo, you know, this, this stress on spiritual exercises. Um, and that seems more, more measured. I mean, do you, do you think there's this, I guess, a combination of this derangement and then a sort of... Um, a measured awareness or a, a something along those lines? I mean. Yes, but I'm in my slightly irritating way, um, and I really like reading about Haddo, and I really like when I worked with Plato's work, um, really loved hearing about the Garden Academy and how there's both the discipline of exercise and then discussion and philosophy. Um, but the moment something becomes set in a kind of trope or a way of right, exercising, right. I, at the moment, slightly recoil. Right, right. And I suppose I'm more interested in the discipline of staying present in the difficult mess of the interruption of a confident knowing or right, the right. disruption of right. what it means to have a body and right. be here in the world. Right. Um, which I think is... Because I suppose I might be trying to also question larger sort of cultural norms and a sort of 
fixed potential that I just feel has gone overlooked. So somehow um, my slightly extreme point, which is why I use the protest motif a lot in my work, yeah. is that idea of sort of one tiny voice against a sort of uh, author authority. And by that, I don't mean philosophy at all. I mean a kind of the sort of huge homogenous cultural flow. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And I mean, I think, I mean, I definitely don't think there needs to be necessarily a tension between those different strands. I mean, there's this nice um, remark from Bataille when he says that uh, people assume that method and ecstasy are opposed, but they needn't be. Um, yeah, and, and it's a question I have in the practice at the moment is that I think I'm at a point where I'm really interested in thinking about what would the what is my discipline yeah, then? Yeah, yeah. Having, but I, I'm glad I haven't fixed that or really thought about that too much till now because I think I would have um, fallen on a cliche or uh, not have founded something, if you know what I mean. So I'm just at the point of asking what would that be, but I, 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 um, I don't think it will be anything, you know, like that I could write out as a list and people could do it if they wanted. The next topic we discussed was Yamadaka a conceptual sculpture staged and performed at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, a re-envisaging of Plato's Academy. And we've spoken in, in quite general terms about this sort of, you know, beautifully balanced, you know, you know complex relationship between your, your, your practice and philosophy. I suppose balanced and unbalanced. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, I mean, I'd, what I'd like to ask you about next is an, is an example that... Um, for me, crystallized a lot of these elements really powerfully, which was the uh, Yamadaka Sculpture Park work. So this is a play on the idea of the Platonic Academy. It's Academy in reverse, of course. Um, and you had this, this nice phrase when you were speaking about it before, that you talked about the participation of, of what you called experts in the joy of living. So these are, these are groups who, in some sense, are exercising in, in the, the full Greek sense of that term. Um, in this kind of recreation of Plato's vision that's simultaneously a contestation of it and a transformation of it. And so could you say a little bit about that work and how you saw it? Yeah. Um, the, the work arose by, in a, in a very simple way, being invited to have a dream idea for the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. But I had been wanting for a long time <clears throat> to sort of contest, not contest, maybe that's the wrong word, but to... Uh, have a way of working as an artist with the notion of sculpture, stuff in the world, the art object, but also the notion of people as sort of, or a capacity for thought in somebody as a kind of sculptural process or substance. Um, so, and, and at the time was also feeling that um, there were quite a lot of pressures on me as an artist in, in the actual academy. Um, that were quite sort of bureaucratic. So I was quite interested in working imaginatively with that. Right. Um, and, and almost creating a different sense of wisdom-based learning. But part as an artwork, uh, part as an opportunity for me to study Plato, part of that project was, you know, if, if, you, want, if you decide to study a philosopher's work, and you don't have to be a professional philosopher to do that, as I know, then actually it takes quite a lot of time and commitment. And I'm actually interested in that as a type of artistic life process yeah. as well, the commitment to reading a book. Yeah. It's actually quite physical. It's actually um, psychologically uh, exciting. It's stimulating. It transforms. When you look up around you, it transforms you. So part of that was to allow me to study Plato but at the nub of that, linked to Plato's work himself and his original Garden Academy, was this con contrast between the original Garden Academy looking after the question of what is a good life and how does one lead it? And I was just quite surprised because I saw Plato as the founding father of Western white philosophy, the philosophical tradition that, you know, banishes the artist, that relegates the sensual um, as getting in the way of wisdom or conceptual sophistication, the, the project of philosophy, as it were. Um, I'd always loved Plato for doing that, by the way, because there's a cheeky, bombastic radicalness, like it's an artwork, it's a 
it's a performance, it's an event of thought. Yeah, yeah. And, and punk rock in that context to say, you know, okay, artists out. And, and he does it in a book, so he's not really yeah, no, mean. He, wants, he does he it wants. in a book. So the book itself suddenly becomes this incredible experimental domain, an artistic, on the broadest sense, an artistic domain, but one that has an ethical relationship to who we are or who we might be. But then he actually has this academy where people live together and question after the good life. And I was really pleased to be so, to have this contradiction of the sort of stereotypical view of Plato, to suddenly have it sort of recontemporized. And I was like, this is really exciting. And actually, this is, this is helping me look at what I don't like about the current, my current uh, relationship with the university. So... Quite rightly, I went to an experimental art place to sort of find out, well, what's that about? And so the centre of the project was to, as I looked about the sculpture part, and there I was asked to make a sculpture, I suddenly realised that with these strange modernist sculptures all around the grounds, it was a little bit like the photos I'd seen of the original Academus, where there's huge old bits of rock lying around. Yeah. And I liked this idea of um, building the biggest sculpture that had ever happened at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, but not having to actually ever put a brick or a physical thing in space. So I recast the whole of the sculpture park through a sort of design of thought, as it were, as a, a conceptual strategy, yes. as a contemporary version of Plato's Academy. And then I realised, well, you know, I'm going to cheekily put myself as Plato, the Theosarch, the artist who was meant to be banished. So, and I gave a lecture on the good. I know that's the only public lecture he gave. So I gave my own sort of version to that, two sculptures, so that I, I so that to bring the presence of the artworks as active in this newly imagined kingdom of, of. I suppose Plato expanded in a way, but not expanded away from his origins. That reading on Plato, was quite amazing. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I had. It's rich stuff in there. Um, it wasn't just an a archival visit for the sake of it. Um, but then this, the practice, the exercise of the joy of the good life, I realised that that wasn't my right as an artist, that I couldn't do that, that it wasn't really something that I could go to university educators for either. Ironically, that in today's age maybe the best place I was seeing it was in these alternative, well, I call them alternative, these small groups, like there was a local astronomy society who meet every Tuesday, and it's really democratic. I, I used to go and visit them. Tons of different people go. Some people don't go because they want to look through the telescope. Some people go because they like hanging out with that group of people. Um, and there's, people give amazing talks. Pe they invite people to give a talk, and there's this really amazing connection to the universe. Um, they built their own telescope, and I think for the, the engineering and the artistry of doing that. And then they took me up, one of the people who helped build the telescope, and I looked at the sky, the night sky, far away for the first time in my life. And, and uh, Gary, who became one of the guardians, actually said to me, he said, Hester, do you realise the flesh of your eye has just actually touched Andromeda? for the first time, and I was just like, that is the most profound thing anybody's ever said to me. He was very humble. And uh, so there was, there was a way I wanted to really, and it all happened so privately. None of those groups are trying to be public. They're not yeah, yeah. trying to get in tons of different people. They are just quietly in their private lives in a social way getting on yeah. with enriching a sort of, it's both knowledge-based, they are, un knowing, yeah, yeah. but they're also forming social ties, yeah, yeah. They're helping each other out. They are becoming, you know, um, well, I would say that if we're going to talk about good citizens, that's the yeah, sort of yeah. model. So I brought them into the sculpture park and said to them, um, what would you do if you had this as your playground and yeah. you could work with people to share some of your, in, your inspiration? Because Plato talks a lot about literally inspiration and... Um, rather than, you know, professional knowledge. Yeah, yeah. So I really wanted to focus on that and develop this term called a liberate, liberational manoeuvre, which was a way of humans working together 
in relationship to inspiration and freedom. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's interesting. I mean, partly I mean, for so many reasons, but one is that it obviously brings front and center this, this question of the banishment and of the ethical role of the artist and of ethos in the broader sense. I mean, this is almost a kind of curation of forms of wisdom, of forms of giving meaning to life. Um, and there was another platonic trope in there that I wanted to ask about, which is this idea of, of inspiration and, and of, of, I guess, the ion model and of the sort of divine spark. I mean, there's an um, image from the, the larger project, um, The Sacrifice of Athena, in which you're wearing this kind of um, pointed steel helmet, um, almost as if it's a kind of lightning rod, a sort of lightning conductor. Um, and I was going to ask, I mean, given that that runs through then this whole romantic tradition of the artist as divine inspired, how, I guess, how sincere or unambiguous that gesture was, what you, what you saw, thought of that? That was so pivotal for me as an artist in the project. It was very sincere, but it, it, it seems to me whenever I'm most sincere and serious, I become ridiculously humorous at the same time. Right, right. So um, I would have liked that, those images to be really heavy and serious, but I also think they're quite funny. Um, I, it's less, I actually do want to talk about that sort of inspiration, um, not because I think it comes from God or divine, but that notion that there might be um, the explosion of your fixed subjectivity, and there's these sort of gaps that open up, just as there's gaps in knowledge. And I think that you do have to sort of, um, it is like you're, as an artist, and I think people or philosophers, I don't think it's just about the artist. When I talk about the artist figure in that project, and I cliched, I was quite cliched, I wore a brown artist smock the whole time, that was less talking about genius inspiration of the painter and more of potential the human creature um, as a very specific living entity who can decide to be incredibly imaginative and open, um, less because there's a God or inspiration that comes in, but because we have the tools and the capacities, both physically, sensually, but I think also sort of quasi-existentially, ontologically, uh, for other possibilities. And in those photos, on one hand, I look like it's divine inspiration, but I also look like I'm passed out. It's almost yeah, like, you know, yeah, yeah. it's the artist. She just let all those guardians get on with it, the local groups. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, smoke too many spliffs, you know. Um, is the artist making this project or not? Like, actually, yeah, yeah. the local groups run the project, but actually there was a lot of work I was also doing, but very backstage. And I like this idea of the artist being both dramatically mythical, but completely backstage, yeah. so that the whole artwork functioned almost like this sort of machine. Yeah. Um, and one of those elements is that idea of um, daemonic inspiration, yeah. or, which is slightly deranged when, yeah. when Plato actually extols that. On one hand, he bans the artist, go deeper into that work, and he extols the artist. Yeah. Um, it just finds it dangerous. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I thought I mean, that backstage element was interesting because it seemed it's that, that it seems separated off from, for example, kind of shamanistic models running through people like Boyce. There's, a, um, there's inherently a more democratic aspect to it. Reeve and I now turned to the question of conceptual personas and the way in which these figured in her artistic practice and in philosophy more broadly. The next topic I wanted to ask you about was this idea of a conceptual persona. So we've, we've talked a little bit about the Platonic background. And of course, in um, Yamataka, there's a moment when you have this kind of cutout of Plato from the, the School of Athens. And you sort of, you can stick your head through it and literally speak as Plato. And there's this kind of very direct taking on of this conceptual persona. And, and I mean, indeed, anyone can do this. And it can be kind of wheeled around as a prop. Um, and so you've got this kind of interesting allusion to the role the role that you know, the persona, the philosopher, uh, has taken on, the authority that comes with that. Um, but then you also note this, this interesting tension, because in a sense, this idea of a conceptual persona is coming from the Deleuzean tradition, and there he, he separates it off from art. He says that it's not an artistic thing, mm -hmm. that art should be about affects and sensations, basically. So could you say a bit about how you see this idea of a conceptual persona in your practice? Um, it sort of links to the protest aspect of some of my works, which is a, a sort of 
protest of the lover, really, to philosophy. Um, I find the concept of the conceptual persona really fascinating and energising. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but I particularly, I think the thing that made me really do it as a part of my practice was as a kind of way of the artist, the artist having a voice and a platform in relationship to a philosopher and saying, ah, 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 ah. It's like, I mean, Deleuze and Qatari write amazingly about art and philosophy. I mean, I, I, and that whole book, What is Philosophy, is just a fantastic book. Um, but one of the things that concerned me was that even there again, even though I, I like the way they talk about art and sensation and they attribute sensation to thinking, so they're not, they're not falling prey to this more traditional story between the artist and the philosopher as told by philosophers, um, with the artists usually mute about what this relationship is between art and philosophy. And that, that story by philosophers is usually, whether they're extolling art or not, that philosophy is conceptual, Plato, um, and wisdom, and, and therefore higher, and art is sensual, the body, imitation um, by inference, and therefore lower. Now, we know that's the classical model in the past, and a lot of philosophers have, have, put, have changed that. But, but there is that thread that comes through. And so, and it was possibly, um, uh, uh, maybe I was looking for an antagonism just because I think it's rich and fruitful, um, that I was still interested there that the word sense and this, this link to the body and matter and objects, this, this complete um, continual uh, addiction often by theorists and philosophers that when we look at value in art, we, we have it all wrapped up in the artwork. And I'm a lover of our objects. I love the fact that an object or a thing can hold so much, both be a thought thing and a thing thing. I, I, I love all that. But it's just not it's just not that, because there's also the abstract thinking of the artist and the practice of life that goes with that. Um, so, if, so when Deleuze, even Deleuze and Qatari are still, luckily they're valuing them the same, but they're still using language, um, and, and they're masters, like philosophers hold a lot of authority and power. Um, and they're still saying, well, art does it this way and philosophy does it that way. Um, and it's less that I want to say they're exactly the same, but I was like, hold on. I do think that there is something conceptually generative about art practice, maybe not art works. And so that tension made me think, God, and that conceptual persona thing feels so much like an art, an, an art strategy on their part, which I love them for, a really genuine philosopher art strategy. Um, that I just felt I have to do that. I have to have one. Yeah, I mean, so that, maybe that's the next thing I was going to ask so, you about. So you, you have one. I have of one your own. as I mean, an artist and yeah, as an art practice. Yeah. Now, they talk very clearly, and I mean, I think it's one of the most powerful bits of their writing. When they talk about the philosopher's relationship to the conceptual persona, there's a very powerful bit where they, they say, um, you know, the conceptual persona is not the representative of the philosopher or the philosopher's ideas, it's a sort of subterranean sort of force that allows thoughts to be thought in their thinking and text that otherwise wouldn't have been thought. And then they describe the artist's eyes coming back from the land of the dead, you know, that the philosopher becomes strange. I mean, their being has become disrupted. So I'm like, that's fantastic. Um, they talk about how Nietzsche says, or somebody somewhere said Nietzsche talked of Zarathustra as not being a choice, but that Zarathustra sort of stole up upon Nietzsche and then, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that late, later Nietzsche is saying, you know, I'm not a man, I'm a dynamite, you know, because Zarathustra is sort of like, has completely challenged and reordered him. Yeah. Um, fragile beast, he explodes. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, there there's the model of almost uh, the conceptual persona seizing, um, seizing the writer, seizing the artist, as opposed, for example, to another way of thinking about it, think about it as a mask, say, that's deliberately deployed or, you know, yes. tactically deployed by a writer or an artist who's remaining detached. And, and I think it very much could be that too. I'm more interested in the sort of grisly version 
Um, my, my version is... Yeah, tell us about your version. So with hrh.the, which I know is a mouthful, and I think everyone thinks it's really pretentious, and people generally don't like asking me about it, and actually that doesn't matter, because I really had to do that really to energise my practice. I mean, it, wasn't, it was a decision that I just knew I had to do because I, it was quite early on when I was first really committedly reading philosophy and realising, oh, I never really quite felt at home as an artist. Reading philosophy makes me feel at home as an artist. How, how incredible. And I started, my practice started to encompass the reading of philosophy. Um, and I, there was something I was trying to get at in my practice as an artist that was quite difficult, that was quite challenging, because you don't just logically sit down and decide what you're doing. Even though some of my work is quite well thought through and structured, it, it's not a logical plan. It sort of comes from some sort of strange negotiation with a blind spot, actually. And I knew that I, this blind spot was now more blind than ever before, and I certainly wanted to avoid sort of art practice, art practice and the taste in the art world. And deciding HRH.the just literally freed up something in the way I was abstractly thinking and making. Right. So it's quite private in many ways. And um, it's definitely not me. It's like a... And it's, an artif it's artificial... But in the way that thought goes to work in the world, it, it goes to work on me and my practice somehow. So it's been really, really useful. But I, when I spoke earlier about that question, like, well, what is my skill? What is my training that I want to do as an artist now, having sort of swept the board and recomposed all of that through philosophy? Actually, I'm now asking that question. I'm more open. OK, what is my skill linked to HRH? .the? What is what is my discipline? Because there can't just be wild frenzy and vulnerability and um, all of that stuff. There yeah. is also uh, skillful production. And yeah, yeah. I mean, one, one final thing I wanted to ask on that is, so as I understand it, the HRH is has, has to read honestly. Is that right? Or that's yeah. one, one thing it, it, it is? Yeah, no, that's what it is. Um, I mean, this idea of honesty is, again, interesting because, you know, of course, there's this whole discourse of honesty and authenticity and, you know, that in some ways ties into romanticism. Um, and how, how you see that kind of discourse, I suppose that fits with the model of the persona appropriating the person rather than the persona being something the person has chosen yeah. with yeah. any form of detachment Absolutely. or with any form Absolutely. of play. It might um, seem pretentious and strange and a pseudonym and other, but actually... It's true, HRH dot there is some sort of artistic agency energy is far more me right, right, <laughs> than right. I am. And by that, I, there's, I know there's no sort of little essential seed that's me, but in terms of trying to operate out of something that's not constrained by all the, the sort of problematic habits and um, right, yeah. fixations of uh, being somebody... Um, then HRH dot there seems far more. So it's a, li that. It's a liberational it's a li device. It's a liberational device, right, exactly, right, right. yes. The next topic we addressed was dialogue, and in particular, David Bohm's model for philosophy and practice. So I wanted to ask you next about how you see, I guess, both dialogue and speech. Um, so, one, one idea I know you're interested in is the sort of dialogue model that um, David Bohm's advanced. So this is a sort of picture of dialogue as um, it's among a group, it's um, non-hierarchical, it's aimed at producing a certain kind of creativity. Um, and he clearly saw this as being a sort of um, fundamentally important device that if you could switch to this form of dialogue, it would unleash all kinds of new um, political and, and intellectual possibilities. I mean, what's, perhaps if you start by saying a bit about how that's interested you and how you yeah. see it. I think because as an artist, I've always um, felt this sort of, and I, it's a strange thing because it, it feels a little bit dramatic, but that since I was very tiny, some of my first thoughts were sort of about, what are, what are we doing here? And less in terms of what does it mean to be human, but more like, really? Is this what we're doing? Is, it, is this what we're doing? Um, as if there were other potentials or things we can be doing together that we don't do. And it certainly wasn't, I'm not talking about religion or anything like that. Um, so always that has 
been there. And so one of the, there's, it's a double thing with Bohm that was so exciting when I came across his thinking that was also a practice. My God, a thinking philosophy that's very abstract on some level because um, it links to his ideas on quantum theory as well. Yes, of course. Um, but it's also a, a life a famous, practice. Yeah, he was, he was also a famous, a famous physicist. Um, but comes from, on his part, a larger concern about precisely those broader cultural problems and the fact that we, we have a lot of cultural problems, but we tend to use the same kind of thinking that sets up those kind of problems is precisely the same kind of thinking we use to try and solve those problems. So it's a really broader, yeah, yeah. insightful, perceptive view. Yeah. Um, at the same time, he recognises the role of the individual, um, less to have genius thoughts, but that actually we are the carriers of these paradigms of thought at the end of the day, whether we emit them as thinkers or carry them as scholars or, you know, and they infiltrate everywhere. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, and he felt that, so he came up with this sort of philosophy and practice of dialogue as a way for humans to meet together in a way where they could actually expose the apparatus of thinking to get deeper. And with the hope, but there, there was no, because it, they, these are radical groups that meet with no agenda. Because he felt if you sit people down and say, look, we're worried about X, we've got this problem, let's solve it. And yes, we are worried about this, and yes, we all would like to solve it. But you sit down with that guiding your thinking, and you're not really going to think, you know. Um, so you sit down with no agenda, and it's really difficult, it's really messy. It's very hard to even get people to come and do that. So it's quite uncool that way. And there aren't necessarily measurable outputs, although if you're in one and you do it and people manage to think together, which is a terrific demand and really hard, but it does happen. As one person said in a group where it really was happening, she said to me afterwards, I felt like our bones were present. Huh. Which is a very powerful thing to yeah, say. Indeed, indeed. And she said that's not even because of a particular content. That was just a sense of when you manage to really think together. Yeah. And, and Bohm was very interested in insight. Yes. And I, and I think I suppose I am too. This links to what I said before in terms of when I had the sort of metal lightning conductor yes. um, helmet on. This idea of you have to work very hard in order to make something new happen or to think something. But it's not just you. It's like, it's also matter. It's your brain. It's yeah. history. It's other people. It's relationship, you know. And, and Bohm would say it's also the implicate, what he called the implicate order, which is, you know, maybe Deleuze would call it imminence. So the idea that there, there is also uh, other, there are not even other dimensions, but there is, you know, you know, I think Plato called it the participant or the receptacle, whatever word yeah. you want to call it, uh, without making it a specific thing, that, that can have its way with us too. Yeah. So it, it's quite incredible that this thing happens, and it's so simple. I, I trust it for that, because you just need a room and a door you can shut and a circle of chairs. What you really need, those people committed and willing to sit down at least for a day together. Yeah. And that becomes almost a political as well as a creative challenge in today's world. But it is very powerful. And I know people could say, well, isn't it inward looking? And actually, if you really work and think together, it's not inward looking at all. And, you know, change is not just about a decision by an MP. It, it's sort of a molecular possibility. And in this case, it is exercised through language, but you, you literally hear, la it's like people become printing machines, and you can literally see a kind of thought shaping that they hadn't had before, because it's sort of really in response to what someone else was thinking, and then they, you see them sort of use words to try and say what that is, and then they put it back in the middle of the room. So that, and it makes it sound a bit, you know, avant-garde and weird, it's, it's not, it's people talking, but that's, that's, it's quite strenuous and sculptural. Yeah. Um, so you get beyond the personal and the agenda by doing that. So I, it's a kind of live art, it's a kind of performance, it's a kind of event of thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, and quite free. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting, I suppose, also in relationship uh, to Greece and to your, your, your view of Greece and the sort of possibilities that were contained in that, because I guess I'm something that you sometimes see in the sort of modern tradition is, is that Socrates is basically the bad guy. Socrates is the villain because 
um, it's not an open dialogue. It's all rigged from the start. And you, I mean, you see this in Nietzsche. You see this in people like Levinas that um, Socrates lures people into what seems to be a free exchange, but actually um, it's this kind of iron cage where they're going to have to go down the road um, he wants them to. And I think one of the many things that's interesting about your kind of reclamation, I guess, of, of the academy model is precisely that it doesn't need to be like that. And, and so what's interesting is that it connects up with your, uh, your use of the academy model and this sort of reclamation of what you know, was obviously also present in the platonic context, which is ideas of a, a free dialogue, of a liberational dialogue. To close, Hester and I discussed the links between the conceptual side of her practice and the physical or material form of the objects involved. The final point I'd like to address is, is I guess, the materiality of the work. So, I mean, you, you use this beautiful Laurentian phrase about, their, uh, about the idea of thought things that are also things. And so one dimension of that is, is the interplay between the physical processes and the kind of metaphysics. So I was thinking in, um, in Yamadaka, you have, for example, you have these cartoons, which are, are obviously copies. You know, there's the copying process involved in them, but they're, of course, a reference to the whole platonic metaphysics. Um, you have the cut-out copy of, of Plato that we spoke about before that anyone can stick their head through. So there's a sort of inherent reference in the materiality of the pieces to this underlying platonic metaphysics. Yes. I mean, I suppose that's the whole tension between um, artistic practices and philosophical practices, not that it has to be separate, and, uh, which I find very exciting, but it's very time-consuming, because I'm really... Like, I read philosophy really seriously. I mean, I don't always understand it all, and I certainly couldn't write about it. I mean, I fall to pieces when I try and, you know, write about the things I'm reading. But I really feel I receive it, and I, I go there with certain philosophers and their writing. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's experiential in the way that an artwork is experiential in many ways. But for me, I'm not interested in words at the end of the day. They're, there is something about the way matter itself can stir us. And I have certain questions of myself because I sometimes do think, why have I got to do something else when there's so much amazing stuff around? But that comes down to this very specific human relationship and what we can do with each other and how we can excite each other. So, And I think philosophy is very exciting and I think it's there to and I don't mean titillate in a superficial way, to really stimulate human being and human life. Um, but I can't stimulate through words. I have to do it through material. Now, before I started really getting involved in um, reading philosophy, I was often making and really not knowing what I was doing before I started. And part of me really still loves doing that with drawing. Um, but at the moment, with the, uh, what's interesting is what is that relationship between manifestation, material manifestation, and then these thoughts? Um, and at the moment, the way I feel about that is I feel it would be dishonest to pretend that I'm doing that thing that a lot of artists do where I just shut off from all that thinking and just start making, because I don't. It's almost like all that thinking rearranges me. It both makes a free space where the sort of art taste stuff I can get rid of but it also rearranges me, and then I face the sort of that experimental space, which is beginning, starts abstract of making to see what can be made. And then it's almost like I'm really interested what form arises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not just, it's, it's not done through some, there is some material experimentation. Um, it's as if you subtract from the sort of knowledge and information of all that reading and you come to that disruption and that gap and that space where you're very active but you're completely non-specific and you're not thinking verbally. And then I sort of just... Well, I don't know what to say. I touch, I feel out. I, for the form, that fits that. And that's the only way I can describe it. It's like a skin belonging to the abstract idea, not, not illustrating it, not representing it, although I think there's elements of that that come across in my work, and I'm okay with that, because there is something inevitable about represent, representing at the end of the day. We can't, 
we pretend we don't represent, but we do. Um, and representation can be very exciting. Uh, but it's more about that sense of feeling a form. And, I, and studying philosophy, when I studied philosophy here with John Cannon, and, which was really rich working with Kant, uh, and aside from my responses to Kant, which has been really rich for my practice, it made me really realise where some of the differences are for me as an artist and a philosopher is that when it comes to argument, I just completely decommission and switch off. But when it comes to form, then I go on this huge journey and just see where it takes me. So it's about finding some sort of form, but that it's like a skin that feels right with wherever that abstract... Whatever that abstract beingness I'm left with through the read, reading of the philosophy, which is also my own thinking as well. It's not, I'm not just letting philosophy program me, but obviously there's a thinkingness in human beings that philosophy helps you clarify. Yes. And you're not just a piano anymore. You're like, yeah, there's yeah. some artists, if that makes sense. But nah. I mean, one, one, one um, aspect of the form that I found particularly interesting is there is, there is in some of the works almost a kind of artisanal component to it. So, I mean, I'm thinking of... Um, for example, the carved paintbrushes, or you know, there's a sort of um, intense, I guess, informing of the object in the Greek sense. You know, that it's uh, taking on this very detailed, very time-consuming, um, deeply penetrative um, embodiment of the ideas. Yeah, that that's that's interesting because I suppose that's where there is more um, uh, more immersion in the materials. Yeah, that, I think that's very important, actually. You're helping me think about that. I think because there is a sense of commitment to both the abstract dimension, but then knowing ultimately, just like come back yeah. to me and my relationship to you and humans, you come back to matter, you come back to the world, and just this sense of care, attention, commitment, devotion, um, and skill to some level. But I'm not trying, that's not about like, oh, artists should be skilled, but that yeah. there is something, there is some sort of intensity yeah, that yeah. comes through that's both material and not material, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And I would, because I'm not a philosopher, I think I want to have that through material rather than through words. Yeah, and I mean, and obviously it's an interesting... Um, in response on so many levels, but you know, partly to a to a vision of art that you see in, in some contemporary practice, where the artist is, you know, designs the stuff and then you know basically has has a group of people put it together in some offsite area without him or her ever having to touch touch the object. Yeah, no, I need I need that involvement and that commitment. Yeah. Finally, we talked about Hester's reaction to the philosopher Immanuel Kant, a figure who she worked on during her residency here at KCL. So I know, I mean, I know when you were on the residency with CPVA, you worked with John Callanan, who's a, um, a Kant expert. And I was wondering if you could give, I mean, many people find Kant, you know, the sort of awe-inspiringly difficult philosopher, you know, and he's the sort of paragon of rationality, paragon of, of reason. I mean, as an artist, is there perhaps one, one example you could give us of what you took from Kant or what you found in Kant or what you, what you found challenging or problematic there? I was quite surprised how much I liked him. Right, uh, right. Uh, but then I, yeah. You see, I'm really interested in reason. I, I think, I, this is maybe a misreading of Kant, I don't know. And John was very patient with all my discussions with him about this. You see, I found something very imaginative. Yeah, no, in indeed. In aspects indeed. of Kant's yeah, works. Yeah. On one hand, it is very, you know, it's like, I. I definitely was very fortunate to be able to do Kant with a Kantian philosopher because I, I don't know how much I would have got on my own. But having had that instruction with John, it meant I could really spend time in Kant and feel quite comfortable and feel quite a real human being there who was rational and traditional and like, it's like, oh, I'm really doing like real philosophy here. But really there were some turns in his thinking that I find were imaginative, where he's not going for argument and proofs. It's as if he's having to, through his very amazing brain, feel out a conceptual form and at the end of the day say, 
well, I'm going to have to put it like this because it's the only way it makes sense. And, and I can you found give us that, an example of that? Um, well, or, the, or one that you found interesting? I th well, the, the problem is that I, I just can't hold things in my head, so I'd have to go back to my Kant notebook to get there. But it, it, that there was something to do with the moral law, yeah, where yeah, fundamentally yeah. with this very important part of his thinking, where there's tons of argument and tons of nooks and crannies and you know, everything, all the medicines are on the right tray in the right place and he's ticked every box. And then suddenly he's saying, and this is the big one, that I, I, I can't prove this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just thought how wonderfully imaginative, how... And because it felt right. It didn't feel an imposition. Yes. It didn't feel dishonest. Yes. Um, but then also, although I studied uh, uh, the morality with John, I, I had always wanted to go beyond the more traditional reading of Kant and the critique of judgment, which often I have you know, through teaching or studying. You, know, you do the sublime and blah, blah, blah. Yes. And I started reading more towards the end of that critique and getting yes. into notions of the aesthetic idea. Yeah. Yeah. My God, this is this is effervescent, yeah. expressionistic. I know, and incredible, it's, yeah. incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's one of, I mean, it's one of the bit. I think particularly that that is one of the bits of Kant that could have been written, you know, ten years ago. I mean, there's there's something so incredibly both modern and postmodern yes. about that. Yes. Um, and also, I think in relation to the um, the groundwork, the question of morality, I've often thought, and I mean, I think. This is something that John's written very powerfully about. That some of some of the most interesting things that are happening there were when Kant argues about what you don't need to prove. That yes. there are certain questions yes. that are in some way beyond proof, or where the proof of them is has this kind of immediacy and a directness that any kind of traditional syllogism is going to fall short of. And then trying to articulate or to sketch around in your terms or to skin out. Yes, exactly. And it goes from argument to form in in some sense. I mean, just. Incredible, yeah. And again, this is where that lacuna is, I think, between art and philosophy, and it, it, very exciting. And yeah, as a contemporary artist, that part of the critique of judgment is really stimulating and helping me, yeah. Fantastic. Hester, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure.